thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking to you today about some work I've been doing on system calls for the Linux security module infrastructure. So those of you who don't know me, uh, I suspect there are some of you out there. I've been doing, uh, I'm Casey Schaufler, I've been doing kernel development since the 1970s, uh, starting out on, on Unix systems. I've been doing, working on uh, operating system security uh, since the mid-1980s. I'm the author of the SMAC Linux security module, which I did in a, a fit of peak after a discussion with some SE Linux people about a topic I don't even remember anymore. Uh, I've been working on the uh, LSM infrastructure for a, a bit here, and throughout this process, um, I've had periods, including the current one, where I'm a hobbyist. I'm doing this uh, just for the sheer joy of it and uh, the, the sheer uh, pleasure of having patches reviewed. I also haven't done a presentation live in three years, and I forgot my clicker, and it's bugging me. But, so I'm going to start off with just a touch of Linux security module history because I think this is a little bit of important background. In the 1990s, uh, operating system security was in a very turbulent period. In the mid 80s, uh, President Ronald Reagan had, uh, oh, <laughs> no, no, I, th that would be your clicker and see, and that would drive me even crazier than not having one at all. Um, it was a very turbulent time. Uh, in the, in the mid 80s, um, no, <laughs> no, thank you. I, yeah, that's, <laughs> okay, that would make me even crazier still. Okay, this is going to be a joke here. A, a running gag here for the entire <laughs> the entire presentation. All right, um, he had, they had introduced this this executive order that said all U.S. government computer systems had to have a particular level of security and have been evaluated by the National Security Agency to have that level of security by 1992. It was called C2 in 92. And so all the, all the Unix vendors went out and crazily implemented uh, features to, to meet these standards and had gone through the evaluation process and spent millions of dollars doing this. And then 1992 came and the government said, eh, we don't really care about that. So every, so there was a lot of turbulence. A lot of people had done a lot of work on security, and they lost their funding because nobody was, was going to pay for it anymore. Oops. Now, at the same time, Linux was coming along. Linux was brand new in the early 90s. Uh, it was establishing itself as a legitimate alternative to uh, the proprietary systems that were available otherwise. So as we had this, this combination of a lot of security developers who were out of work, uh, who still wanted to work on security, and we had Linux coming in, we had a bunch of security of uh, people with operating systems development ex experience, and we had this wonderful turbulent situation where we had a bunch of people who knew a whole bunch about what was going, uh, going on, how, how to do operating system security, and no place to do it except in Linux. So there were a lot of different viewpoints about what should be done, what shouldn't be done. And in response to this, when Linux actually got around to the point where it was actually going to deal with, some of, with the possibility of doing some of these advanced security features, Linus decided that what he really wanted was a framework for it rather than a particular implementation. And so that led to the Linux security modules mechanism. A li now, the, the mechanism is really pretty simple. Uh, many of you are f familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, the mainline code calls something called security foo. And security foo may or may not actually make any decisions based on that, but it's going to go out and it's going to call SE Linux, uh, SE Linux um, hook for this, or maybe an app armor, or maybe a yum, or whatever security modules you have, it's going to go out and say, I'm just going to call all of, all of the ones that I've got listed here. And if any of them say that I shouldn't do it, then it's going to return, return an access failure. And so implement an additional restriction, not replacing the existing policy, the existing security mechanism. It's an additional thing instead. So 
very much like our castle here where you have the high walls and the moat. So you have to swim out and then climb up as opposed to just climbing up from the ground, which would be too easy. So LSMs are really kind of, at this point, a bolt-on thing. It doesn't actually use the mechanisms that are there. Otherwise, it, it's something, it's, it's its own little thing. It's pretty much self-contained. So traditionally, the way LSMs interact with user space, when you have to do a configuration issue or a, a, a change of things, is through file system interfaces. So one set of interfaces are going to be completely LSM specific. For example, SE Linux, SMAC, um, have their own file systems that you mount, that get mounted when you start the file, start, <laughs> start the system, that you go off and interact with. Um, AppArmor uses um, SysFS, uh, sorry, SecurityFS. Uh, so you use that. And there's also a mechanism in, in slash proc to get LSM-based attributes. Now, um, so if you, you, uh, you can read one of these interfaces, it'll get you a set of, the set of information. Uh, current is the one that's used most frequently, and that tells you the current security attributes of, you know, provided by the LSM for, that, for your current process. And um, it's the LSM specific implementation. So for example, um, AppArmor puts a new line at the end because when you cat, that interface is much more convenient that way. Uh, SC Linux doesn't, SMAC doesn't because it's just the, the raw information. So there's no consistency there. Or there's no, and there's certainly no guarantee of consistency there. And this is fine. Yeah, we've got a bunch of the, these interfaces. Um, but how would you use them? How do you actually help you know, get the, uh, the real values out for, the, for an application space, user space to use? Well, when I did SMAC, I made a bit of a mistake. Um, um, I decided to reuse proc self adder current, which was what SC Linux used for the, the, the uh, current con you know, security information. And the rationale was very simple. If I do a PS dash Z, capital Z, I'm going to get the information because all, the, all that PS is going to do is going to go out and it's going to read proc you know, self adder current or proc adder, adder current for each of the processes. And print it out, it'll all be really easy. And I'll use, and it'll work for ID too, right? Well, unfortunately, ID is uh, compiled in such a way as to only do that if you actually have SE Linux involved. Uh, but <clears throat> that's a, a small matter of, of programming there. But it means that you can, you, yeah, you, ideally, you're thinking in terms of it doesn't matter what LSM you have if you're, you're using current because it's going to give you the information. You can do whatever you're going to, going to do with that. Unfortunately, a lot of applications then say, all right, now I'm going to go into a function in libse Linux, and it's going to tell me what to do with this. And that doesn't really work very well if it's a smack label. Um, it turns out the same thing works with, with um, SO PeerSec, which is a mechanism to get the, the peer credentials from a socket. If you just pass the, the context without any information about what LSM it is, it's generally going to assume it's SE Linux because that's the way a lot of the applications have been written and you may or may not get the results you're after. Uh, it's unfortunate that as I made this mistake, it was adopted, adopted as conventional. So AppArmor did the same thing, um, adopting you know, current as the the current context. So now we've got a case where we have what I'm going to call the current conflict here. And um, okay, so in the picture, this is a grand mistake I made. Another grand mistake I made. I was <clears throat> having a, a, a party for a friend's birthday. He was turning 60. So we put 60 candles on the cake. Yes, it's possible. Yes, it's not recommended. 
nicely caramelized the icing on the top. Uh, the flames went three feet high, but and we did manage to get it out. So it, it's just kind of a mistake on the same order here. All right, so we could, you know, and we could s stick with slash proc. You know, we don't have to have to get away from slash proc. There are ways to address it. We can address the, the what I've called the current conflict. Um, one way is to create a subdirectory in in Adder for each of the LSMs. And that would work really, really fine. It would be, be very smooth and very, very obvious. And everybody switches to yeah, their applications to use uh, an appropriate subdirectory, depending on which LSM they're expecting. Um, but you still have the, the base entries to deal with. And so that doesn't really solve the problem until everybody has switched over to it. Another mechanism is to have a mechanism to say, I want to change what, which, LSM, which LSM might be displayed there in current. Well, that's going to be awkward. At, at best, that's going to be awkward. Um, or we can say, let's add entries so that in addition to having current, we all can have, we're going to have contacts. And it's going to come out, and it's going to have information about all the LSMs in it. Well, that leads to the question of how are you going to format that? And we actually put a good deal of effort into discussions with uh, user space community about how that should be displayed. And in the end, we ended up with, um, and this is used in, in some other places for in where there are multiple entries for information, but I refer to you as the hideous format. Uh, it's not really that bad, but it requires a careful application um, in order to use it. That's a blobfish, by the way. Um, so it would be, the format would be LSM name terminating null uh, attribute value, LSM terminating null. And yeah, this would work, but really this isn't very pleasant to deal with. So using, you know, extending into slash proc, although we could do it, it's probably time we did something different. So we want to change the mindset. The mindset of, I have an LSM, it's responsible for all its stuff, for, for everything. It's going to have its own user interface. I'm going to have a file system uh, that meets meets my idiosyncratic ideas as to what should be done or shouldn't be done. Let's actually put some LSM independent interfaces in place. Let's do it differently. Let's admit that we've got multiple LSMs here, that we're going to have different LSMs on different systems. Let's just kind of do this better. Introduce a little consistency too, not a bad idea. And because what I've been working on for the past 10 years or so is uh, Linux security module stacking, I really want to make that part of what it is we're going to achieve here. So now, why do we want to use system calls instead of proc entries or a fi special file system or s some other mechanism? Uh, a system call is generally an atomic operation at least from the viewpoint of the application. Uh, you're going to do one thing. You're not going to have to open a file, read the data, close the file. Uh, you're not going to use the file descriptors with the way either. Uh, it, they're better suited for binary data. It's traditional, or conventional rather, that file system interfaces use text strings. And text strings are really nice unless you have to unless what you're doing is, is, is a big glob of data that you then have to parse or produce in the correct format. System calls also have ABI stability. Anybody here like ABI stability? Okay, there are at least a couple of you. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, you know, not having special file systems required means you don't have to mount them. You don't have to know the path name. You don't have to, to do any of that. You can just do it. So that's why you want, I think, 
we want to do system calls as opposed to some of the other mechanisms that, that we could possibly use. So if we're going to do system calls here, what system calls are we going to do? I hear you cry. Well, um, we're going to do the ones that we need to have for stacking because that's what I need to get done. That's what I'm trying to get done. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, perfectly willing to, to uh, go beyond this, but for right now, this is the set that, that I'm working on. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to replace the things that you're getting from pro proc self adder about you know, the information about your own process and the list of LSMs because you need the list of LSMs if you're then going to decide what to do based on what LSMs you're using. And so we're going to actually have a, an API, yeah, finally, an LSM API. So as we're designing this, one of the, the key elements is how do we make sure that it'll work when we have multiple LSMs? Or, and how do we make it so that it's generally useful and, ex and extensible as we go forward? So we're, we're, we're coming in with a structure LSM context, um, LSM CTX. And we've got a bunch, bunch of uh, data in this in order to make it generally useful. All right, so the first thing is the LSM ID. This is a new thing, newly introduced for the system calls. To date, you have always referred to the LSM by its, the text of its name. If you want to do something with SE Linux, you're saying SE Linux. If you want to do something with SMAC, you're dealing with SMAC. Uh, by introducing an LSM identifier, we, have a, we now have a numerical value that you can use to identify the data that's coming out with an LSM. This is, is fairly important if you're going to have a user interface uh, because you don't want to have multiple variable size entities in your structure, in your data. If you have multiple variable size data, somebody's going to break it. It's much harder to deal with than if you just have a single value. So uh, the LSM ID again it identifies the the security module. Uh, it's a number. It's reserved in in LSM.h. Uh, we've, we've reserved the first 99. Well, zero is is defined to be undefined, and we've re Reserved 1 through 99 for future use. What that future use is, if I could tell, read the future, then I could read the future as opposed to not being able to read the future. Uh, it might be used for containers. Uh, if you want to have a mechanism to return all the traditional attributes, that could be interesting. Um, one of the things that, that's been bantied about a long time is the notion of how can I get all the security attributes at once without worry, without you know, doing multiple system calls that'll, that'll happen at multiple times and give me different uh, inconsistent data? That's one possibility. Not actually implementing that yet, but that, that sort of thing. Uh, next thing would be flags. And this, these are things that are special about this set of data. Uh, possibility is that it's transient. It's, Oh yeah, I'm giving you this data, but beware that it's in the process of, of changing and you might want to do something about that. Or uh, another one that came up is, what happens if I give you, a, if I find a value and I'm gonna give it to you, but I know that it's invalid in the policy you've defined. Uh, again, not something that's being implemented today, but the kind of thing that you might use of uh, flags for in the future. And of course, if we don't have it now, then we would have to add it later. That would be a rev of the API. We don't want to do that. We also decided it was important to have the total length of the object, the, the whole LSM CTX structure, including all the data that it contains. And it gets padded out to 64 bits because we want it to be uh, API friendly regardless of what architecture you're running on. The context len is the length of the actual data, the actual attribute data then that you're returning. Um, and in a, a, in a, a major win for 
uh, API commonality, it includes the trailing null, null byte. Now, why, if, if, it's a, if it's a text string, of course. Now, why is this important? Well, because over in, in the, since we've been introducing LSMs, we have been very inconsistent about whether when, when you get the uh, information about the the attribute, whether if it's a string, are we we're giving you the length? Is it are we including the null or not? Well, it's been sometimes yes, sometimes no, and so we're just saying fine, we are going to do it. And then finally, there's the data itself. Yay, we want to have the data. Uh, so it's the attribute data. It, again, it contains the trailing null if it's if it's a string, but it can be binary. Now, this is something we actually had a very thorough discussion about. It's like, do we want to, at this point, put our foot down and say, all of these are going to be text strings? And although some of us, um, <laughs> some people said yes, some people said no. The, the argument for allowing binaries are things like if you were implementing a traditional Bell and Lepodula model, you might want to have a, a security label, which is a data structure, rather than a text string that then has to be parsed by the kernel into a data structure. So allowing a binary, again, gives us maximum flexibility. We want flexibility going forward because we want everybody to use this. So. I'm now going to talk about the system calls that we're actually implementing. Now, there are three. Now, the first one is LSM list modules. It simply gives you a list of the LSM IDs of the security modules that are active on the system. Not, necessar not the ones necessarily that are compiled in. You may compile in a bunch of them, but only activate a, a particular set. And so you get the, the list of uh, LSM IDs for the ones that are active. Uh, you send it a buffer, you send it the size of the buffer, um, you send it flags. Again, this is something that's currently not, none, none are supported, but uh, I'm sure that if you wanted to, to report them in alphabetical order as opposed to numeric order instead of order registered, you could do that. Um, but I'm not planning to support anything like that right now. Uh, and it returns the number of IDs received. So in this case, it would, say, it would return four, and so I've got four security modules. Okay, so the next one, and this is kind of, kind of the, the biggie as far as um, the multiple modules idea is concerned, is LSM self get adder. So you pass it uh, the attribute that you want. So we actually have to introduce, in addition to the LSM ID, we need to introduce an attribute ID, which matches, for example, um, the, if you want the current attribute or the preve attribute, we have a different ID for each of those. And so you, you pass it that, and it will then and a buffer and the size of the buffer and flags, which we've got one defined for. We'll get to that in just a second. And it will tell you, it, it, turns you, it returns you LSM contexts for each of the LSMs that support that attribute on your system. Um, and it gives you them in order. And it, again, it returns the number of them that it's received. And it resets the size pointer to the actual size that, is, that it's returned. Now. This brings up something that I <clears throat> forgot slightly earlier, which was that the reason we have a size and a context size, because you can, uh, you know, I, yeah, ideally, you should really only need one. Well, if somehow you wanted to have additional information as well as the context, if, we, if the size is bigger than the size of the structure plus the size of the attribute, then you can have, sneak some more information in there for a particular LSM and still maintain the API. I don't know that I would want anybody to do that, but it is feasible and you could then do that. Um, we have a flag, which is LSM flag single. 
Um, somebody, somebody said, you know, it would be really handy if I could, in my, in my, uh, my buffer, if I put the LSM that I want in the, the ID field and pass a single flag, then it will only give me that one. So I don't have to get all of them. I can only get the one that I, that I really want at this point. So we implemented that flag. So this, this um, points out that having flags really is valuable because there are use cases that are slightly different uh, that crop up. Now, LSM self get adder returns you as many attributes as are available you know, for that particular um, attribute ID. Uh, LSM self set adder is a little bit different here. It only let takes, let, lets you send one. And the reason for this is that if you set, try to send in three attributes and the third one fails to set because it's invalid or um, policy doesn't allow it or some, some other reason, you then have to unwind the first two. And that means that every system, every LSM that implements that attribute has to be able to unwind it safely. And that seems like a heroic task. So it's much better to, to say, we're just gonna set them one at a time because they might fail. Getting them is much less likely to fail than setting them is. And again, you're gonna send an attribute, tell them which attribute it is, and then you're gonna have the LSM context uh, in a buffer. You're gonna send the size of the buffer just to make sure that everybody's happy. And when we don't have any flags and it returns zero when, when it's done. So these are the first three. Uh, in the future, we are also going to think in terms of using this structure as our primary representation for security attributes when they're coming out into user space. So we have uh, SO peer sec today, which gets you the, you know, the, the security context of the other side, and that works as long as you only have one. If you have two, you need a mechanism for getting more. And rather than trying to um, fiddle with uh, SO PeerSec and, and have it provide something like the hideous format, um, we want to introduce SO Peer Context, again, this future work that would actually, again, return LSM CTX structures which then are a common format. Everybody knows how to use that. Uh, and of course, in, in the future, anything that we, we want to have do security, extended security attributes, we want to use LSM context structures for just to make sure that we actually do things rationally so that people know how to do it. We don't just arbitrarily change the API, have, now, arbitrary APIs because, well, that's kind of fun because it isn't. So we have some potential future LSM, and I apologize profusely in that as I was writing the slides, I forgot my conventions. And so I put the, the get instead, in, instead of putting the noun first and then the verb, I put the verb first and the noun. Um, but you can transpose that in your head if you're if you're so inclined. So one way, one obvious system call is to get the security attribute of another process rather than the current process. Uh, that <clears throat> that's a, actually a reasonably common um, thing for people for programs to do. Uh, it has. You know, one of the advantages to it is you can, rather than having to open the, the ent entry in slash proc and then have the process go away while you're in the process of, of reading it, it's, again, it's atomic operation. It, you go do it, it comes back, it's all done. Um, similarly, uh, how about the attributes on files? It would be real nice if I've got multiple, multiple sets of, of attri security attributes on a file, if I could get them all at once rather than having to guess about whether they're there or not and pull them in. Now, this is actually fairly different 
from getting it for a process. But uh, again, potentially very useful if you want to to support that kind of thing. You want to support that information um, on a more general basis. Uh, another one, access. Well, let's let's say I want to pass in a bunch of attributes and say, hey, this file over here. If if I had these attributes, could I access that file? Um, there's the access system call, which does that sort of for UIDs, but we don't really have anything like that that you can use um, in general for LSM. Smack actually has a mechanism to do that, but this isn't available as just kind of a general thing. So, so we've got some some uh, other potential system calls here, um, and we got got the ones that we're defining out right now. Maybe it's time we had libLSM. Uh, what would libLSM provide? Well, it would pro of course provide uh, interface you know, interface names for the system calls. But you could also use it to create emulations of those system calls for systems that don't have those system calls yet. Because we're currently replacing the functionality of existing interfaces, the PROC interfaces, uh, this is kernel security interface, we can do that using those interfaces and the application can write to the, the new modern forward looking APIs without having to have a, a kernel that's really fresh and squeaky clean. You can actually use that 419 kernel that you, pops up every so often these days. Uh, another thing we can have put in libLSM are functions to parse and uh, pr you know, you know, to, to parse the LSM context structure, to to um, to fill in an LSM context structure, to allocate one, uh, to deal with them in general. And some people prefer to, to use functions rather than to actually deal with the, the data directly. So, where are we here? Huh, well, that's about all we're talking, all I've got to, to say about the matter at this point, dramatic juncture in the narrative. Uh, LSM systems really are overdue, okay? At, at some point, it, it looked like there was just gonna be one, one security module and everything was going to go that way and then that broadened out. We have, have more options here. Uh, it also looked like initially security modules were gonna be rare. You weren't gonna use them very often. Well, Android kind of blew through that one um, almost, you know, the only people who are not using LSMs at this point are developers. So all, you know, production systems all have LSMs of one, one flavor or another. They're better, you know, system calls are better than, than going through, than, than kind of the Clue G proc interfaces we have today or the, the security FS interfaces. And as we're Coming out with a few system calls now, we're kind of going to set the the ground rules, the the direction that we're going to go, do for LSM independent uh, application spaces going forward. And it's I think that's really over, again another, it's something that's overdue. So that's what I've got to say. I'm happy to have some questions here. I have a question from online. Someone is asking, is there an estimate for within major LSMs and how they can be stacked? Is there an estimate for what? what? For within major LSMs. For when it, major LSMs can be stacked? Okay, in 2010, um, I made a comment that ended up on Linux Weekly News and it was like you know, stacking, yeah, I used to be against it, but now I'm kind of for it. And really all we need to do is buy somebody a, a case of the beverage of their choice and turn them loose on the problem. I still haven't gotten my case of beverage. Uh, I think that 
The code's been done for years. Um, it's been getting polished one way, you know, this way and that way. I, am, I have no idea. I would like to say I, I expect it in, in a year, but I can't say. Next. Hi, Casey. It's Mike. Um, so you'll have to forgive me if this is a bit of a tangent. Maybe I'm starting a bit of a flame war. Oh, good. I tend to do that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I, I heard you talk about, you know, maybe having a little extra space at the end of the of the binary uh -huh. format where you can maybe put some extra information. You'd rather people not use that space, but it's going to be there. And I got to thinking of, about a topic that, that's come to mind a few times uh, for me in the past, and that is that, you know, we, we have um, a concept of something that has a schema where you could optionally have members of the schema. Um, you know, this is this notion of a protobuf, a protocol buffer. And there are very efficient binary, you know, formats um, for such a structure like cap and proto. And you also talked about having a library that's going to be, uh, you know, the, the element that interfaces with the kernel in order to parse the information. And I start, you know, asking questions. Is this a great example of something where we're going to have a stable ABI? We're going to have an interface. Would we want to think about using um, something like protobufs where you have a schema and you have optional fields in order to help deal with this problem of funny extra space at the end of a structure? So let me date myself on this. Um, I think that that's really more technology than the problem requires. Um, I would encourage people who, who write new LSMs to, when they do so, actually make their attributes fit in, make all the information they need fit in their context. If they can't do that, then the mechanism is available to, to use more space afterwards, but I really wouldn't encourage them to do that. Um, I really want them to use the inter you know, use the context the way it's defined. And if they can't, you know, it, yes, there are people who are going to do things wrong and are going to come along and say, oops, I need to, to redo my API to include this additional information. I, but I would really prefer that they think about it in, in advance and not do that. So, and I don't want to put a big mechanism in place to allow them to, to make it easy for them to do that because that's a bad thing. Or that's, if, if that can be a flame war if we want. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, that's my, my, my position on that is I'd really like it to be right, the, you know, use it right. If I can maybe add to that a little bit. Um, I know we've had other discussions about protobufs in the past in other contexts, if we can overuse that term. Um, we've got, what, it's in the 400s, the number of system calls that we have right now in the Linux kernel. I want to say it's 430. I can't remember the exact number, but um, I don't believe any of them make use of protobuf currently. And I understand protobuf offers some things which would be attractive here. Um, however, the LSM needs to be relatively careful with what we do with the kernel uh, because there, there was a joke that Casey made about the only people that aren't using LSMs are developers. And I would say, to reword that slightly, I would say the only people not using LSMs are core kernel developers. Um, the LSM is not particularly loved in big sections of the kernel, and I think simply introducing syscalls for the first time, in case you mentioned, we're only starting with three and that's somewhat intentional because we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on something until we know that there's some buy-in at the top levels. And I don't want to introduce system calls and also being protobuf into the Linux kernel at the same time. I feel that that might be a bit too much. And I think what we have should be sufficiently extensible for our limited needs um, that we don't necessarily need to go the protobuf route. Um, if protobuf had been in the kernel for several years and people had been using it, maybe this discussion would be different. 
but as it stands right now, I don't know that we want to take on system calls and protobuf at the same time. We've we've got enough headaches. Hi, Casey. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I didn't follow the discussion regarding the, the choice of the um, system call. Um, I was thinking, uh, so for example, when you have a file, uh, a file inherently supports multiple SM because you can have extended attribute, one for uh, C-Linux, one for SMAC. Uh, Actually, you, uh, you, you might have three for SMAC. Okay, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, what if uh, you you present the same interface for uh, for current? Uh, for example, you implement a, a virtually uh, extended attribute methods, in where you say, okay, if you do list etc., I get the uh, active LSM, and when you do get etc., you get the value for uh, current for that particular LSM. So, part of what's important here is that there's no reason you have to implement your attributes as, extend, as extended attributes. Uh, you could, for example, <clears throat> remap the group ID to uh, a mandatory access control label. And before anybody says, why would anybody do that? It has been done. Um, it was the least, <clears throat> the least painful way on that system to implement mandatory access control without changing the file system format. Um, there are other files, other mechanisms to implement the extended attributes that don't use X adders. Uh, in fact, X adders are one of a relative newcomer uh, in that in that mechanism. So the system call so you. When you say, oh, we'll get the X adders, well, you can't necessarily say that those are, in fact, the security attributes, or that those X adders are exactly the security attributes. You can conceive of an LSM that would read, read the attribute off the disk and say, ah, I'm on, an, I'm on an ARM architecture, and on ARM architectures, I, I perform this trans, transformation on that data to make the actual security attribute, or on an x86, I do it, do another transformation to make that security attribute. Um, so when you're actually asking, what is the security attribute, you're not asking, what is the data of the security attribute, you're asking, what is the attribute, what do I want to present to the application space, which may, again, may or may not be what you actually have out on the disk, or in the backing store, or on the tape somewhere. It, it's a different problem, and that's one of the problems we, that we can address with the system calls. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great, you can address the, the issue of abstract, of taking the repre representation issue out of the problem and just providing the attribute. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, cool. thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I still have a question about the interface. Why have to be system call? I, I think so. I think the the file maybe looks better for me because the I/O control function pointer is more is also very expressive, and uh, we can treat the LSM as a module. Uh, keep the design style. Um, yeah, I I octal is always. <coughs> Yes, it would, it would have been an option for files. Um, the problem is you'd have to use a, a, a PR control in order to get the information for a process. So, and then you'd need an IOCTL to do, to do things for files or an F control for files, and it's not nearly so clean. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for paying attention. John, you can wake up from your nap now.
Thank you.